Welcome everybody in this week's seminar. We have a pleasure to, to have uh, Anya David with us. Uh, so Anya is a PhD student uh, in the group of Maastricht Levenstein in ICFO, but also a student PhD student of Michał Tomza from uh, University of Warsaw. Uh, Anya, yes, I think works mostly in application applications of broadly understood machine learning to quantum physics. Uh, yes, and today she'll be, uh, like if I remember the abstract correctly, she'll be uh, talking how one can, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, how well machine learning techniques can be, uh, how one can, <laughs> Sorry, like, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 okay. Like, it's okay, you, you like, just don't want to she, be talking know, about a better matters job. Matters of like interpretability and reliability of those special learning techniques when applied to physics problems. Sorry for my, <laughs> yeah, the screen is yours, Anya. Great. No, no worries. I appreciate this interaction. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I always really love explaining this, this, this the machine learning research. I think this is still very, uh, very uh, uh, the landscape of many unanswered questions, and uh, we can really do an interesting science there. And as uh, Michal mentioned, I will be explaining today, today how we can make any machine learning model more interpretable and more reliable, uh, and especially in the context of phase classification. Uh, and ba so basically, I will be I will mostly focus on 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 our publication that appeared lately uh, in machine learning science and technology. But I will also touch upon a few other results that we had uh, on on our way. And just maybe a small disclaimer. So if any of you is fascinated about ultra cold molecules as quantum simulations, I'm also happy to discuss that. This is the other half of my PhD. Uh, but today, let's focus on the machine learning. Uh, I think this is uh, that the, uh, this this tool, this machine learning toolbox, is gaining uh, momentum in uh, quantum sciences. Uh, I would say it started uh, the boom started in 2017, 2016. Uh, this this paper was one of the like uh, works which kicked off the field, and it proposed to use machine learning models as a representation for quantum states. Um, it the idea proved to be very fruitful, and uh, as a result, it was also used for machine learning was also used for quantum tomography. Um, and uh, there are many ideas how to connect machine learning approaches with optim optimization of quantum experiments, for example. So, and there, there are ideas how to use machine learning for quantum error correction and uh, uh, this kind of kind of. Uh, uh, ideas are, blo are blooming, but we will focus today on phase classification problems, which were one of the first um, fields to tackle with machine learning. And I think it's pretty intuitive why. Uh, so last decade, uh, the, the, the development of machine learning was focused, I mean, I would say that the, the largest development happened in the, in the field of image recognition. And if you imagine representing quantum state as an image, and then different images, different quantum states are coming from different phases. This image recognition, image classification, quantum state classification, phase classification is very an uh, intuitive uh, chain of, of like thoughts. So uh, basically you had a, a ready machinery. We just had to do some tweaks and it was ready to use. And since then, since 2016, 17, we had a plethora of work uh, tackling classical models, quantum models, and experimental data. And even though I would say it's one of the most uh, acknowledged uh, fields in uh, machine learning for sciences, there are still open problems which are left to uh, be answered. And uh, there are two like more physical, uh, um, I mean like uh, problems which, which are problematic for uh, physicists, not maybe for machine learning people. So there are two classes of problems uh, which are still pretty challenging for machine learning. Um, and we, we see that em empirically. So we try to solve this and it doesn't work. And these two classes of problems are quantum many-body localization and topological phases of matter. And uh, we see in practice that when we train our machine learning models 
on uh, systems, we should exhibit NBL in some uh, parameters and not exhibit NBL in some parameters. This the predictions are really sensitive to the hyperparameters describing the training process. Hyperparameters meaning they should control the quality of the training, but they shouldn't be anything that your result is depending on. This is this is a problem because it kind of uh, tells us that, that our model is not learning anything physical, anything that is like makes sense. It just it just overfits. It just looks at any possible correlation, but this correlation doesn't make sense. So we're still not sure why this MBO is a problematic uh, area, uh, but uh, we even suffer we suffer even more with topological uh, phases. So uh, we just see that when we train on, for example, Monte Carlo configurations, uh, and it works in different kind of phases, it does. So our model is not able to predict uh, whether this, this phases is topological or discern between different topological phases. It just doesn't work. So you need to do some pre-engineering of the features usually to, to see that. And there are some hints why machine learning doesn't work with topological phases. And sh very shortly, uh, th this is because people see that machine learning models are really focusing on like local features. And as we know, order parameters are something which is, which is global. So models should look at the whole picture at the, at the same time to, to try to, to be able to uh, discern this other parameter, and we know it's not the case. So maybe this is one of the reasons, but it's still not really solved. And maybe the more fundamental problem is that so far with this classical quantum experimental data, we mostly recovered known results. Uh, and uh, and if if we just got known results, means that we didn't learn anything new. So fortunately, we we uh, achieved that at much lower cost, meaning that there is some use uh, and some, some uh, reason to use machine learning uh, methods, but we still haven't learned anything new. And there are general problems with machine learning, which are connected to this, to this uh, setup. And this is this lack of interpretability and reliability. So machine learning systems are known for being very expressive and they are able to fit arbitrary functions. And sometimes it looks like so. If if your machine learning doesn't a model doesn't work, you just try as hard to add additional parameters and you make it work. And um, but in the end, it can really fit a very stupid uh, uh, um, element of data which doesn't make sense. And uh, there are also many uh, research uh, works showing that, for example, our model can look at the background. And if you change it in a very small way that it's invisible for humans, it will completely derail uh, your model predictions. And there is also a question of fairness because your model is only as good as your training data. So if you put some bias into the data, the model will inherit this bias. And it's of course important for like insurance or, or hiring decisions, but for physics, it's also important because it tells us that if we have some bias about the data, the model won't be able Ignore, to ignore this bias, right? So this is something we should also keep in mind. And finally, there is this trade-off between how complex, how expressive our models are and how interpretable. So unfortunately, it's of course uh, reverse. So the, the more expressive, the less interpretable. And the, the, the like special black boxes, which are of general interest because of their power, are neural networks. So we will focus on that. So to sum up the motivation for, for this research, so we want to address, first of all, uh, okay, so one of, the, one of the motivations is to address open problems of machine learning in phase classification problems. So why MBL and topological models are so difficult for machine learning. Uh, but also we want to make sure that our models, which we use for physics, doesn't learn something stupid. And finally, we would like to use these complex models. Of course, they can look at stupid stuff, but they still are really powerful. So how we can solve these problems? And this is like, this, this, this would be the solution, but we, and we were making first steps towards it, but the solution would be to have a reliable and interpretable machine learning, which stays as smart as without these qualities. Uh, and then it, 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 these methods, which increase reliability and interpretability should be independent of model architecture and training. And what I mean by reliability and interpretability here, so by reliability, I mean that our model tells us 
whether it's certain or uh, or uncertain about certain about some predictions. Uh, it tells us whether uh, it's stable against some perturbations. This is the, the the questions that like reliability answers. And with interpretability is every method that tells you what model learned. So what model looks at and why it's making the certain prediction. So there is this human element uh, in this interpretability. Okay. So and perfect the, the perfect thing would be that we don't restrict our model by adding these qualities, right? So this is this is the uh, crucial thing because of course we could just do this use these linear models this or decision trees and then they are fully interpretable as long as they are like humanly uh, uh, reasonable sizes and stop with that and we don't have that many problems as with neural networks but we know that they won't be able to solve problems like you know uh, uh, driving cars or stuff like this. So, um, okay, so this was the motivation. Um, sorry, Anya, yeah. one thing I didn't catch, I, I, I understand pretty well that there are those issues with interpretability and reliability of ML models, uh, but like, uh, or you'll be studying neural networks, so what is so specific about those physical questions, really? Uh, like, so, because the same questions and the same problems you have for, uh, any classification problems, right? That those uh, uh, tools can uh, be used for. Yes, right? yes, yes. Of course, yes. And uh, and for that, that's the reason why we we're not that it's not that such a desperate task because com computer science community is tackling this uh, these problems for like last five years. So uh, definitely. So I mean, if it's probably even more important. I mean, of course, I love physics, but it's probably even more important in real life applications, like when uh, machine learning algorithms are used for um, medical diagnosis. It's good that they tell us why they think that you you got cancer, right? And then maybe this doctor can look at this reasoning of the of the model and tell you whether this model makes sense or not. So. There, yeah, the, the control over these machine learning models should be should be there, especially in real life. However, uh, this was, I mean, the problem is that, I mean, this is my, of course, impression. I may be wrong, but business is uh, encompassing this machine learning methods maybe a little quicker and faster than they should be, taking into account the state of the art of our interpretability and reliability methods, and. And by, because the problem is that, well, if they work, why would we be bothered with this? Fortunately, physicists are bothered from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, critical areas which were people asking why, why it's working and whether it's working. But this is the reason why computer science community is not that advanced in interpretability and reliability methods than into just making this models work because people are more interested in the fact that they're efficient than uh, interpretable. Yeah, right. Okay. But yeah, Thanks. this was yeah, this was really the question. Sorry, I didn't didn't touch upon that. Yeah, and please, please, please interrupt me and ask questions during that if you if I'm you know not explaining something in a clear way. This would be much, much more fun, I think. Okay, so uh the motivation uh, uh, is presented already. And now um I will give you our shot at, at this at this uh at this challenge. Uh we call it Hessian based toolbox. So this is a set of interpretability and reliability methods, which can uh, be used to any machine learning model. So it's really independent of, of architecture, independent of training, independent of everything. Of course, as a, as a trade-off, it provides less information that, that methods which are really um, all used only for particular models and are very limited in, the, in the, their scope. Uh, but you know, it's always something for something. Uh, but to really present how they work, I will start with a brief fundamentals of machine learning, and we can discuss some stuff which should be obvious to anyone doing machine learning, but it's not. For me, it wasn't at all, and I think it's pretty fascinating. And then I, I will go describing this, this method from Hessen tool, Toolbox, and then in the end, I will show you some results applied it to, when applied to face application problems. So let's start with this intro. If someone's doing machine learning, can like, you know, snooze for like, I don't know, five minutes. Uh, but the people who are not, uh, let's, let, let's decide about the definition first. So there are two parallel definitions going on. And my favorite is actually this one. So machine learning are uh, all the algorithms which solve programs, uh, which solve problems without being told how to solve them explicitly. So instead, 
So in contrary to something which is knowledge based uh, uh, program, so you just put a series of ifs and and tell the, the program basically what features are important, how should we classify this problem, how you should solve this problem. You just, instead of this, you just give the data to your model, you give it the task, like classify these images into two groups based on something, like, like into, this, this, I guess this is a dog, figure it out. And you just ask it to find the features which, it, which are influential or important and then solve it. So this is a very different approach, like very, very fundamentally different approach. Uh, but there is also another definition which exists. So any uh, algorithm whose, import, whose performance improves with data, so it mimics our human learning from experience. Um, and now let's get let's get a little bit more into the bottom of that, what, like an example of, of machine learning scenario. And let's focus on the supervised learning, uh, just to focus our attention, but it would be pretty say the, the basic concepts are similar for any machine learning approach so what is supervised learning is a situation where you put the when 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 you provide uh, to the to your model data with labels so you already have to have some human going through the data and and telling the models these are cats these are dogs and so you have your data training data which includes labels and you input them to your uh, machine learning model your model is a parameterized by parameters theta. And uh, we'll look inside of this box in a second, but there are some series of transformations which are determined by this theta. And as a result, the model outputs a prediction, which is uh, uh, interpreted as a class of a given uh, input data. And then you, you compare the, this predicted output with a true label that you know because uh, you have it in, in your data. And you compare it with some, in an object called error or, or loss function, training loss function. And then the idea is that using some optimization method by varying these parameters of the model, uh, you iteratively minimize this error to it's zero or close to zero. So the training, this is, this is all, this is like, this is it when it comes to training your model. You have some, some, some function depending on the parameters theta. And then you optimize it by varying parameters to uh, decrease the error on a certain task, for example, classification task. And now let's look for a second into this, uh, uh, into the inside of this model. Uh, I will be pretty quick about it, but the, 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 the story is pretty simple. So if we focus on neural networks, the, the building block is a neuron. It, it, the, the, thing, the only thing it does, it just takes your input data. So for example, your elements of your quantum state vector and it uh, multiplies it by weights, corresponding weights, and these weights are um, these parameters theta then. And then you add everything up and then you apply some nonlinearity, like for example, this kind of nonlinearity, and you get a single number. This is one neuron. And then you can connect these neurons into more complex um, models. Here it would be a fully connected uh, neural network with two hidden layers, uh, which again, so this is just a like number or few numbers in the end. And you can go even more as more crazy. So you can do something which is conv called con convolutional neural network. And here, instead of uh, doing, of collecting all your neurons in, a, uh, in, this, in this full way, so everything is connected with everything, you can instead tell, okay, I want to have a, a matrix like this yellow matrix, which is called the kernel of filter. The red elements of this yellow matrix are the weights or parameters of your model. And instead of uh, taking just one pixel at a time, this matrix is scanning through your data uh, in, in this way as on the on example. So this is your image, this, this yellow, uh, oh, green. Uh, green image is, is your image, for example, quantum state or a time of flight image. Uh, and it just multiplies each uh, encounter to pixels, you sum it up and you create a convolved image after that. And you can do it um, many times and you can, you can create models which are composed of many convolutional layers and then fully connected layers and stuff like this. You basically combine it and but the, 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 the clue from this, from this slide is the following. Underneath in this complex models, the, com the true complexity comes from the size of it and from the number of parameters, number of operations, the fact that they stack upon each other. There is, there is no magic inside, unfortunately. And uh, you can, in principle, go through these transformations on a piece of paper because you know how to multiply and add stuff up. 
but the problem is the, the, the size and the size makes it really non interpretable because if you look at the whole uh, the whole box which is composed of this kind of uh, transformations you don't understand exactly what it does in a human sense okay uh, but that so can I ask just the quantum context so yes. those inputs so I, I imagine like I mean I imagine I, I'm not an ML specialist but okay like for like for image classification like often you would I know digitize your image and you'll have like bits corresponding to different pixels or like you can yeah. have different colors stuff like that but when you have now a quantum state so uh do you put let's say coefficients of a quantum state there in the left because they are not easily accessible or do you measure the state using some measurement and then mm -hmm. you uh, you put measurement outputs there uh, yeah that's my yeah this is a major question and this is like the, the only problem that physicists had to like solve before just using all these tools that are ready so how to represent in a sensible way the quantum state and in practice people tried many things and uh, I can tell you in detail what I was doing. So in one case, you just pick a basis, for example, Fock basis, and represent your quantum state in a Fock basis. And then you have it like a, a, just a vector, uh, which is pretty long, represented in some basis. Or, you, or uh, in, when it comes to experimental data, uh, we were using time of flight images. So it was only just also just an image. Uh, people were also using like a spin and density resolved like images of your spin quantum, spin systems, right? So uh, basically, you you try to use anything you have, and you hope for the best that your model will extract some sense out of it. But th these were more like, let's say, average quantities in a sense that you you know you say like some expectation values of some observables, or so they were not like single shot quantities that you get from a single round of a measurement. Typically. No, I think no, no, no. You you get like you make a single experiment, you, you you and you get like what I'm saying. You can do average, but you can also put many single shot experiments for one set of parameters, and you input all this as a thing as a and, and you just tell this is all the same phase or this is all gotcha. and this is the noise that that your model should need to take into account, and it it does it perfectly. This is one of the largest I think contributions for machine learning that somehow. Noise doesn't affect it at all. Okay, I'm of course I'm making two, two strong statements, but for the sake of the clarity. <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Then we have this. Uh, we know what's going on inside. This is like simple mathematical operations, but there are many of them. Uh, we have this input. It predicts the out output. You compare. You minimize. You get the error. And I was telling you that we need to have a minimum, we, we, we arrive to some minimum of the training loss function with some optimization method. And you can, and in your mind, there may be some nice, nice curve with nice minimum. But the problem is that the true loss landscapes with, especially with deep learning uh, models, they are terrible and complex and, and not nice. So this is like two dimensional visualization. This would be like with model of two parameters, but in fact, you have like, millions of them. So this is a very non-trivial uh, landscape. And you, you can see it even with this visualization, you can get stuck in some like sharp uh, minima, which don't have such a low values as for example, this broad flat minima. And uh, so there are problems with optimization, but we won't, won't get into detail what I would, would like to like uh, uh, stress. I already told you something like uh, we have sharp minima, we have flat minima. It turns out that, and we don't, we know that again just empirically, that if you land in the sharp minimum, which is like kind of narrow, uh, your model uh, won't be such an efficient model. In a sense, it tends to overfit and don't generalize well. By generalize, I mean doesn't. Uh, it may be, uh, it may have a low training error, but then when it's used for unseen data it will fail or not be as good as the models which arrive to this flat, nice uh, basis of minima. And we don't know why exactly, uh, but, but it was like, experimentally seen. And, uh, but you already see that the curvature around your minimum tells you something about the model, has some encoded information. And we're gonna use that for our Hessian-based toolbox. Uh, and yeah, so this is how Hessian enters because we are looking at the curvature. 
And uh, this is, of course, just a matrix of second derivatives of the uh, training loss function with respect to the parameters of your model. And uh, it's a matrix, then you can just diagonalize it and you can uh, understand the curvature in terms of its uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And then eigenvectors corresponding to positive eigenvalues are showing uh, the directions where your training loss goes up. Uh, the negative ones are showing the, the directions where the training loss goes down and the zero goal shows you the flat directions. Now when we have this object, we can finally characterize the true minimum because this is just an example in two dimensions. What happens in the true minimum of the machine learning loss landscape, which we usually reach in the optimization algorithm. It turns out that first of all, it was very, it was starting to me that uh, majority of the directions like 99.9% .9 directions is zero. So basically you are like in a super flat uh, uh, landscape. You have a few negative directions, but they're like really, the eigenvalues are really, really, really small and it, they, they are coming from stochasticity of your training and usually you don't bother uh, going into the direction because you're already happy. And then there are just single positive walls, right? And the number of these walls corresponds and it was again it's an empiric, uh, empirical result. Number of classes minus one. So again, it tells us that the train lost the landscape and codes and information about the both the data and the model. And this is again something we're gonna use. Okay, and uh, I already touched upon. Uh, um, upon sorry, can I ask something here? Sure, because just uh, when you have those uh, sharp inequalities, there is no problem because there is no kind of scale, okay, scale involved. Like, so what gives you the scale of this uh, loss function? Because like you say, okay, some stuff is large. So like, uh, sure. I'm okay, so, 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 so should I, if, if I understand well that, that empirically you find that let's say most of the eigenvalues of this Hessian are like in this point, let's say are like in, mm -hmm. most of the points are like close to zero and just some are highly po uh, positive. Is that how, uh, uh, or what? This is, yeah, okay. This is this is awesome question. I actually never thought about it too, too, uh, too much. I mean, what I'm, what I can, so what one of the things which is important is like how large is this positive eigenvalue? So, uh, if it's like of order of thousand, and okay. So in the end, I know, understand that, that you're, what you're saying that there's no scale, but in the end, the uh, because of the normalization of your lost uh, training loss, so you, you basically divide by the number of uh, training points always. I'm not saying that they're identical across the uh, the problems, but they can be compared to some point to to some extent. This is the first thing uh, which I'm doing, and I'm not sure of that. And the second claim, uh, so exactly the, the size of this positive positive wall is also whether it's 20 or it's like hundreds of thousands, this is also makes a difference. And then how many how many directions around around you are really positive or how many are are the zero? We, we see that this well-trained model has this kind of uh, characterization of the minimum. So like majority, so you see like this. And when you see additional uh, positive walls you may say that it's you're getting you get you are in this sharp minima which is not maybe optimal because uh so but this this is actually a very good question and uh, i i would actually i i hope that there is a better answer that i that i provided but i don't know i don't know it either i don't know it and i don't recall asking like even you know seeing this question somewhere in a in a paper but i will actually look at it. thanks for that question Okay, but this is like hand wavy answer to, to your to your question. Um, yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the testing comes at the moment when we have a model with trained parameters. So these parameters uh, correspond to the minimum of your training loss function, minimum uh, as I presented a moment ago, and then uh, you can compare the. Uh, it, you can judge the model performance on the unseen data, so data which weren't there during the optimization process, which model didn't see during the training. And uh, this, uh, how large is the test error, show us the generalization abilities of your of your model. And this is actually creme de la creme of machine learning. This is what uh, 
like distinguishes machine learning from from simple function fitting because you want it in the end to have good generalization. You you don't care that much about training error. You want the test error to be to be as low as possible or and and in practice uh, of the order of the training error, right? I mean, like similar to the training error. Okay, so that was a, a, a crash course on machine learning. And now we can get into the, uh, the interpretability and variability methods which uh, we are using in our research. Uh, and the idea behind this method is that we don't want to impact the model and training in any way. So we have a training data, we train our data in the way I, I described. We make a prediction with this model. We don't impact it in any way. The only thing we want to know is the Hessian, uh, uh, calculated at the minimum of the training loss function. And this is what we what we analyze, and we let the model do its thing, whatever whatever it needed. And if you give us the Hessian, we can give you notion of similarity developed by your model. It's pretty powerful because it tells you which data points are similar from the perspective of the model. So in the internal representation of the model, not an input space, in the internal representation of the model, we can tell we can estimate the uncertainty of the model uh, when it's making certain prediction. So we can give you some kind of error bars. And we can also even tell you how much your model is extrapolating. So how much it's guessing instead of basing its predictions on the, on the knowledge of the training data. And uh, all of these uh, are, are methods which are developed by um, machine learning community. So this, this, this the first, the first tool is called influence functions. And so far it's it been the most successful one. Um, th there is this method is uh, which estimates the uncertainty is called resampling uncertainty estimation, and finally uh, local ensembles gives you the extrapolation score. And I will quickly go through them, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe not, I will I will focus mostly on the influence functions, and then I will go quickly through the other two. So we not uh, so I'm not. No, yeah, I just want to understand. Uh, let's say where let's say your results uh, fit in. So uh, this Hessian based toolbox is it something that you guys developed in this work and it fits in this broader paradigm or you apply this broad paradigm to the physical? No, so context? so there are two steps. So first of all, calculating Hessian is an expensive thing. And it, it looks like authors of these papers didn't know, I mean, some of them knew about each other, but not all of them. So it makes sense to compute them together because the most expensive part is done, it's needed for all of them. So this this is like took it, putting it together in Hessian based toolbox, but definitely the largest uh, contribute, like the main contribution was to put that into the physics because I definitely understand people who, who wants to do machine learning in physics, but they don't care about interpretability and reliability because every day there is like two papers about new interpretability methods, which can be, you know, and they say, oh, this is groundbreaking and like really take methods which work and then you try it and it doesn't really work and you don't know why, why maybe it's the authors, maybe it's you. And uh, so I think that it's kind of important to translate the methods from machine learning community to physics and test it and especially like convince people like this is working just use this code it's gonna give you this kind of result uh yeah so this was this was our contribution but the methods definitely know it was developed by by other authors um okay so let's start with influence functions and uh influence functions i think i already actually, actually were explaining them to you guys like two year ago or two years ago uh but probably yeah i, I will i will remind some of you and for others it will be new so you can think of them as an approximation of something called Lee one out training. And Lee one out training is a kind of, is a intuitive procedure which were developed in seventies for just linear and logistic regression methods. So it's, it's methods from statistics. What you do, you have your end training points or end points that you, to which you fit your linear regression problem, but here it's end training points for your machine learning model. Uh, and you uh, minimize the training loss function built on this training points. And you arrive to some minimum, you found some optimal parameters of your model, and you can, with this model, now you can make a prediction on, on the, this orange test point. And now imagine, this is it, and now you imagine you remove this one training point and you train your model again. You arrive to the, and this is one assumption I will like, skim through, 
uh, to the same, uh, um, like almost the same minimum, but now it's a little bit shifted because you removed one training point. So it's not the same minimum as it shifted. And now with this model, you can make again the prediction on the same test point. And after removal, three things can happen. So either your prediction got uh, worse. So now your test point, test, test error is higher. Your, your prediction got worse. That means that you removed a training example which was helpful for this prediction. The opposite can happen. So after removal of the training point, your prediction may have uh, got uh, better. So the test error went is smaller. It means that you removed a training point which was harmful for this prediction. And of course, also may, nothing may have changed. It would mean that this point training point wasn't influential at all for your prediction. So you already see that you can you can get some reasoning behind the model predictions, model model analysis of data, and in, in, in particular, you can make a statement that if two data points are similarly influential or similarly harmful, similarly helpful for a single prediction they are similar to each other. So you start the getting idea how the similarity measure will come into the picture. Uh, the problem is with this leave one out training because you could, you could use that in principle, but it's very expensive because you would need retraining and then you also don't have, a, you're not certain if you will end up in the same minimum because you can, uh, as you remember, there's this wobbly lost landscape. Uh, you can end up in different minimum that you were competing. Uh, so instead what you can do you can do an analytical approximation for this leave one out training, which is much cheaper, and uh, which amounts to taking the inverse of the Hessian, this is expensive part, and uh, like you need to calculate uh, the shift of your minimum due to removal of the training point. And you could, could can do that with that. So you, it's just a gradient of your training loss function calculated on the single training point that you're removing, that you're removing, that cause removal your uh, impact you're approximating. Uh, and you need the curvature to know how, uh, how, how like, I don't know, life uh, looks around you, right? So this is the step towards your minimum. And then you calculate it against the gradient of the test point. So you basically answer the question here, how much my test point prediction would have changed due to shift of my minimum, due to removal of the training point. So this is what this, this uh, um, equation is about. And actually, I think we can make it even simpler when it comes to interpretation. Uh, so, oh, sorry. And this is of course the authors, uh, this is authors of the generalization of this, of this uh, uh, equation to machine learning, because of, it's again from, this method is again from 70s. <laughs> So people are rediscovering this kind of stuff for machine learning. Uh, but this geometrical interpretation, which I believe is much more intuitive. So you can think of that, this two gradient, this is like a scalar product of this two gradients. Ignore, ignore the Hessian for a second. This is a scalar product of two gradients, which is large if they are like overlapping and small if they're like orthogonal. So this gives you a, like a similarity, but then it's corrected by the local curvature described by the Hessian. And this is actually, uh, 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 yeah, this is the intuition that was provided by a friend who's doing like uh, um, uh, relativity theory. And then, then they, this is how they take local curvature into account. And this is, I mean, this makes sense, but uh, uh, yeah. So this is, this, is, this is really nice idea. So this is a scalar product in the internal representation of your model. And this is how it gives you a notion of similarity in the uh, uh, learned by the model. So this is influence functions. Are you like, I hope you're happy with that. Uh, if not, please interrupt. Uh, okay, and now we go to something else. Oh, a question, another yes. question. Sure. So, so here you are leaving, uh, it was like this, those influence functionals that were kind of, if I understood what they said was a proxy for this leave uh, one out, let's say, training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, but like in practice, do people do, Okay, so one can, not in practice, one can imagine leaving out more than one point, right? Like yeah. just a few points. And then, yeah. so I imagine it's on the trainer, on the trainability side, it's still, it's even a greater challenge because you have 
more like maybe you have to train more but like do, did people think about general, generalizing those inf influence functionals when you remove more than one point let's say yes <laughs> so it's a it's a paper by the same authors one year later so it's exactly they they did that and uh Actually, in this case, because you can think of, you know, larger and larger number of points that you're removing and uh, looking at how it impacts. And then this leave one out training gets less and less expensive, right? Because you just need to do it a few times. But then you still arrive at this problem that um, uh, you usually should start from the same minimum to not escape from it. And uh, this turns out to be still cheaper alternative. Plus, then you don't really know how, because you can, you know, of course you can compute it for like four batches of data and I mean, removing four batches of data, but then how did you choose these four batches? Is it, do, do you already know what you're looking for or you're just doing it randomly? If it's randomly, maybe the impact will average out because you choose points from very different uh, spaces. So it's kind of, it's a kind of combinatorial problem. And then it may, it may look like it's cheaper to compute, but you still need to make, compute it to for very different batches of data, right? To see some sense. So yeah, but definitely people people did that, and there are also interesting results coming out of that. Um, okay. If no more questions, unless there is question. Okay, thanks. <laughs> then uh, we can go to the sampling assembly estimation, and it's another method which is just a generalization uh, to modern machine learning models. Uh, of a technique from 70s. So the, the technique from 70s, maybe you know it, it's called bootstrap sampling. So uh, how it works. So imagine you start with the, again, as previously, you start with a model, which is trained on uh, each data point uh, in the, on the training data set, which is taking, sorry, which has only one instance of each training point, right? And now you can imagine again, that instead of training on this kind of uh, data set, you can uh, uniformly sample from this, from, this, from this original training data set and create bootstrap training samples. So if you sample uni uh, uniformly, it can happen that some of the data points will be uh, completely avoided. Like here, the first uh, data training point would be avoided, but the second, third training data points taken three times. So basically you're kind of, and making many bootstrap samples like this are basically perturbing the, the, the training data by erasing and adding more copies. And you can imagine you train your uh, B machine learning models on this B bootstrap samples. You make B predictions on a single test point with this B models, they kind of vote together and you can compute out of, variance out of it. And this would tell you how the prediction, how stable is this prediction against perturbation of your training set? And again, it would be expensive. So instead, you're just making an appro analytical approximation of that, which is exactly resampling uncertainty estimation. And I won't go this time into um, details. This is the intuition behind it. So again, you're approximating the techniques from 70s, which then tells you about stability and can you can get er like error bars from that for the uncertainty of your uh, of your prediction. And finally, local assembles are kind, are kind of funny. So uh, I was telling uh, so, you. Uh, yeah. Anya, can I ask about uh, this bootstrapping? Like, if this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how much? Uh, because I uh, I know that people sometimes use it, but uh, maybe how much uh, kind of uh, rigorous is that analysis? Uh, like, about those error bars derived from it? Like, uh, what are mm -hmm. the assumptions or stuff like this? Uh, uh, if um, you know it. So, uh, but what kind of, uh, uh, so, okay, so there are Well, so things. I understand that you are like uh, uh, doing something with your data, like you divide it uh, and then uh, kind of, gener you are kind of generating a new data yeah, from the exactly. data you already obtained. So this is mm -hmm. why it's called bootstrapping. Yes, uh, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, and uh, the point is that, uh, well, you know, it's uh, uh, in general, there is no magic, so you probably, <laughs> have uh, like uh, you need to assume something and then based on some assumptions you can get uh, either like uh, well some rigorous guarantees or just some heuristics and the question is like in what part of the spectrum uh, it is so to speak it is yes okay uh, so uh, actually I wouldn't so I would say that you don't need any uh, rigorous assumptions to this procedure 
just you have to really restrict your interpretation of what is the error bar that you're getting because it's not like, like a, it's not an error you, you don't have an, a magical access to unknown data that you haven't seen so it's not a true error bar right but what it tells you is how okay so it tells you two things actually so imagine that your prediction can be really really depending dependent on one single trading point and probably it, it almost never happens that one trading point has important information that everything else is missing so probably you learn something stupid and then if you if you see this instability it, this will fire this variance here will fire up because in some bootstrap you will uh, 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 get rid of you will get rid of some single training point so this tells you about this kind of stability uh and but the other also the, the other thing that we can tell you um is hold on because i had the thoughts and i forgot it uh if yeah okay so the, I, I would say this is the interpretation i had some other thought because i, I think i was wrote it in i, I wrote a, a, another, another intuition in the paper but now i forgot but i will look at that and i will uh, tell you but this is definitely yeah, sure. about stability uh, about your so it's not true error bar it's like about how stable the prediction is against the per perturbation of the trains and whether it's fixated mm -hmm. on so um, outliers or not i see i see i understand uh, thanks that's very helpful okay awesome i'm glad Okay, and then finally, this local ensemble. This is, and I'm in, in a sense, one of my, my, my favorite because it's, uh, it's really easy to understand. So I told you already that uh, when you land in your minimum, uh, you are surrounded by multiple flat directions. And what flat direction means? It means that if you move that, that direction, your training error is exactly the same. So in, it means that it's, you, it shouldn't matter whether you're here or step next to it from the training error like point of view. Uh, but this is this is uh, those last, last landscape built on your training data, and now we can ask about if, if that's the, if that's the case. If your prediction, if your on, on the test point is well based on training data, if it's like again similar a little bit to your training data, and you can. Uh, 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 make the statement. If you will make a step towards this flat direction, nothing should change with your prediction. Your prediction should stay exactly the same if you move in this flat direction of the uh, of uh, around the minimum. If not, it means that probably your model is extrapolating. It's not that the prediction is just a guess instead of being based on the training data because the distance point is in some some way similar to the training point. So basically, you can make an average. You can you can uh, wander around this this flat directions and check whether your your predictions are changing. And if they do, your model is extrapolating. If they don't, your your prediction is well based in the training data. So this is so this is this has a little bit more. Uh, it, again, you you it's not about an error like error bars and like how much test you would error you would make on the other unseen data. But it tells you really about your new prediction, whether your model thinks that this prediction is similar to the training point and it, whether it has like good intuition on this on this on this new test point. So this is pretty powerful. Um, okay, I managed to talk a lot about methods, but uh, I hope at, you, you enjoyed uh, at, at least. I think we started like five minutes later or maybe 10 or how much uh we are relaxed with uh with okay. time so we started like let's say five minutes after yeah we okay no i was i was starting up in 10 minutes okay if it's if it's okay uh but then i will i will go through some uh i will skip some results i'm always getting so you know cut up with, <laughs> with metals that i don't have enough time for results but okay with this uh now you see that we have these three methods and what you can gain with this three methods so uh, no, when, when influence function give you the similarity, uh, you can, by analysis of similarity, you can tell something about the phases. You can detect new phases, actually. I will show you how. But if you know that something is similar, you also know that something is very not similar to the rest. So it's intuitive that you can also do an anomaly detection in your data with influence functions. Finally, I mean, finally, the, the third example is that I will show you how you can detect extrapolation on some simple physical example that will give you a hint what extrapolation is and how it, what we do to like, detect it. 
And finally, we, I can show you how the error bars can be used to detect the transition width of, of your, the width of the transition between your uh, phases. Okay, so I will be working here on this, in this result section on two kinds of models. And for the sake of, of time, I will just really skim for that. But the idea is that this is, uh, that here we have the simulated numerical data. So this is- Anya, Anya, you really can like relax. We are not under pressure of time. No, but I also don't, yeah, I mean- <laughs> You also don't want <laughs> time. Okay. Um, I, I mean, on one hand, I, I really appreciate it, but on the other, I, I mean, I know that it, it, it's really hard to listen for someone uh, to, to someone for one hour straight without any break. <laughs> uh, okay, then I will I will I will make it slower, and then you can just you know cut me off, and then we uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's try this way. Okay, so with this simulated numerical data, uh, we we tackled this uh, very it's it's a well known phase diagram. We didn't discover any new physics here. This is basically more proof of concept. So we want to prove to the community that we can show something based on the, on the results that we know and we know what to expect. So basically here, we hope to confirm our expectation. So Anya, Anya, just for like, so this is like you said here, uh, so-called quantum phase transitions, so probably some features of ground state of this particular Hamiltonian. Exactly. Seems for, like fermionic Hamiltonian on one D. Perfect. Uh, system, you have nearest neighbor hopping, you exactly. have- Exactly. Uh, nearest neighbor nearest hopping. Na mm -hmm. And you have those three parameters and the ground, so it seems, okay, that the ground state of this Hamiltonian probably for like what the number of particles uh, what is fixed here like number uh, we of have, particles or? we have 12 half feeling, okay. half feeling 12 sites okay. yeah exactly uh, and we have this phase there with this four phases okay so and just gonna... just just this clarification for yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not, yeah not for ammo people you know <laughs> oh yeah thanks oh yeah this is yeah good point yeah, so uh, by, by interplay of these parameters, you can have this kind of phases. So you can have either staggered then average density of like occupation of your sites, like one, zero, one, zero, or if you increase the next nearest neighbor's uh, interaction, they get like more repulsed and you get like density, a pattern of one, one, zero, zero, one, one. And looting liquid is like, uh, aver on average it's uniform and bond order is when you have an effective, staggered effective hopping between uh, between some sites, right? So, and uh, this is the phases. Actually, you don't need to even like understand the phases to, to understand what we what we show, but it, it's nice, of course. And this is kind of a vector that we input to the machine. This is one dimensional vector with the coefficients being uh, like coefficients in the, in the fog basis. So this is exactly our input, input vector that we're gonna feed to the machine. And the other side, uh, side of the coin is gonna be, and this is much more demanding, we're gonna tackle experimental data, so time of flight images coming from the flock realization of a two-dimensional topological how they model. And now this this sounds like if, if you're not among people, this sounds like uh, 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 yeah many new words. But what is important? What is important? We have uh, this this kind of uh, phase diagram. This uh, exists in this system. I think I won't get into details of this system, but there are, uh, these are this c equals zero means uh, phases which are topologically trivial. And these are two topological phases which are different. And this, as I told you before, this kind of phases are really demanding and challenging for machine learning. Uh, and you can also see that this time flight images, this is like time of flight images taken from this part of the phase diagram. This, this uh, time of flight images are taken from this part of the phase diagram and these are here, right? So you can see that uh, they are not really intuitive uh, I mean, and not really, it's not really visible to a human eye what's going on, especially that in, in, in theory, this phase and this phase are the same and like time of flight images is not really agreeing with that. And it's, be it's because here uh, to simulate this very complex model, we need to shake our system. And this is like uh, effect of the shaking. We, we see all this, all this crazy stuff. Okay. So this is, this is two kinds of systems we're going to be tackled with. And first, I will show you how influence function can give us some idea about phase diagrams on the simulated numerical data. Yes. So uh, we will be looking now. Actually, no, I will skip that. But what, what we're going to look now, 
I'm gonna uh, show the machine this this data across this phase transition. So I'm gonna show them data from coming from the looting the liquid, bond order, and charlicity wave two phases. But I'm gonna write to the machine and I will tell tell it, okay, this is one phase. And this is the other phase because we're doing it in a supervised scheme, so we have to tell the machine where our, where phases are. So, but, and by lying like this, we hope that by looking at similarity between data, we will detect the mislabeled phase. This is, yeah. Okay. So and we do, we so we do that. And this is exactly what happened. So what these figures show? These figures show how influential is removal of, uh, of this training point and this training points for a single test, for the prediction on a single test point. And this test point here is from the looting the liquid. This is, this are, this is the, the, these are the points from bond order phase. And these are the points from charge density wave two phase. So we see that uh, when we look at this influence function values, they show us some plateau here, even though we told the machine that all these points are from the same phase. So we see that even though we lie to the model, it's noticed that this, these points inside are not really similar. And with that, we can claim that, oh, there is, a, there is an, a, another phase that we missed and we can detect it. And, uh, by sh and why I'm showing you this on the numerical simple data, uh, because with this approach, you can really easily see what we did with this experimental, very complex data. Our aim for analyzing experimental, because this was like proof of concept, but with experimental data, we really wanted to have a fully automated uh, phase uh, detection scheme. So we wanted to feed the machine this time of flight images, don't put any insights from our part, and get whole phase diagram from the unsupervised machine learning approaches. Problem is that using various um, uh, unsupervised approaches, we were able only to detect borders between these two phase, these phases. So basically the unsupervised approaches said that this is one phase, this is one phase, and this is one phase. Actually, this is something we also could do with our bare eyes. And uh, we weren't able to discern any, any, I mean, differences between these two in theory topological phases. So what we did, we now we turn to supervised scenario. We, uh, we, we told the machine, this is one phase, this is the other, this is the third phase. And then we looked inside of the model by looking how, how similar it sees the data. And in this uh, low phase, in this, this, this phase number, number one, in this, this lowest phase, we see this is the color, this is the phase diagram, and this, the color code is the value of the influence function. So how similar are how influential are these training points for this single test point? So this black cross is the test point for which prediction we estimate the removal of all other uh, points. And we see that this, uh, the, the values of influence functions here are pretty uniform. Oh, here you see that this variance comes from uh, different single shot images. And suddenly we have a very, this is average over single shot images for various shaking phases. So these are, these are how, why this error bars come into the picture. Uh, when we are in this phase, it's also pretty uniform, actually even almost zero. And then when we go to this to this phase that we know and we hope that we see some topological phases here, we see that first of all there are two plateaus which are uh, uh, different by order of magnitude value because this is stock arbitrary fail. But also we see a dips, I mean even more important dips of similarity in between, indicating some phase transition. So. This is the, I mean, we're not claiming we learned other parameter at all, but we claim that we see some patterns uh, indicating that this two phases, that there are two phases. It, we don't know whether it's there. From the machine learning model, we, we cannot know whether it's topological phase or whether it's just some other uh, conventional phase. We just know that there are some uh, dissimilarities within the data. Now physicists can sit down and look at it and try to understand what the, what types of phases we are. So we still not at the moment when machine learning model can tell us what is the other parameter and the, give us some insight on the physics, but this is what it can give us so far. Uh, sir, and it was for supervised learning this one. Uh, yes, yes, but yes, but this was kind of cheating. So super because mm -hmm. uh, this is super, I mean from the perspective of the training, it was fully supervised. 
but yeah. the labels were provided by unsupervised approaches. So in the end, we didn't put any other no our knowledge into the system, apart from the fact that we really wanted to see the topological phases. So of course there was like, because if you didn't didn't expect these two phases, you will probably stop at this moment, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, I have I have three phases in the system, but we knew they were extra. So, so what I'm saying. Right, but so how do uh, because I uh, so I didn't maybe I didn't get how it works. So. Mm -hmm. to, uh, to the supervised learning, you provide uh, labels from the unsupervised learning, but how do you get those labels from unsupervised learning correctly yeah. in the first place? I, I, I didn't tell you about it at all. Uh, due to the time uh, constraints, uh, sure. this would be like another another lecture. <laughs> but uh, an enough. example, there are two examples of unsupervised approaches that you could use here and that we used. So first of all, you can do a very simple clustering. So like really uh, you just uh, um, you represent this uh, images in a high like high dimensional space as as points, and then yeah. you try to find best clusters, which uh, uh, like number of clusters and which best separates these clouds of points, right? But this is kind of demanding, especially. But you can still already see some some uh, clustering which makes sense. But and, what and is this even is, nicer? Mm -hmm. And this is based on like some measure of distance between points or something yes. like this. By, uh, but when po by yeah. point you mean a whole image, right? So so this yeah. is that. But then what you can do, uh, and uh, it's it, it works even better. There are there are um, models called autoencoders. I don't know if you if you're familiar with that. So the, the autoencoders are uh, special neural networks, which the uh, instead of having a task. Uh, you take an input, a vector, and then give me a number which is like zero or one, depending on the classification. The task of uh, the task is you get a vector as an input or like matrix or basically an image. Please reproduce the same the same image uh, in the in the end. And the tricky part is that in the meantime they have a bottleneck, like two neurons, for example. So mm -hmm. the, effectively, what they do, they compress the representation of your of your of your data set. And you can then rep represent the, this data in this two-dimensional space, uh, which is created by these two neurons. So, uh, and then you can do clustering in this two-dimensional uh, space, which is much easier. And this is actually how we got this. Yeah, okay, I'm simplifying. But let's say this is one of the methods to get this. We also did some other tricks, which is pretty cool, but uh, maybe let's not get into that. <laughs> Sure, fair enough. Thanks. Okay, but you see, you, you didn't you, here. You don't need any data, any uh, knowledge uh, on the on the problem. You just say, reproduce me the images. Then you look at the bottleneck. You do clustering, and you suddenly see these three phases because they are clustered in three uh, in three groups. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And um, okay, <laughs> it's like okay. Um, so maybe I will just uh, really quickly go for that, and then you can ask me questions if you're interested. But what we wanted to check with this unwise detection is uh, we want to play it with certain parts of the training data and see whether they're going to be highlighted with this influence function. So they have a very, very different influence function value than others. And what we played with was a global sign of the of the of our um, of our vector, which shouldn't have any impact on the physics. Uh, and should be basically uh, uh, irrelevant, and it should be invariant. That, I mean, the model should be invariant. But it, uh, in, but to uh, yeah. So you can what you can do, you can imagine a data set where most of the of the training points, most of the quantum states have uh, have a plus a, a global sign, and then some of the points will have a negative uh, sign. So this is a global sign in balanced set. Here, model cannot really learn that that minus doesn't make any difference. It will be it it sees this and highlights them as a very different from others. This is exactly what we hope to see. We can see for outliers which uh, which occur in the data. Also, it works for noise in the experimental uh, setups and stuff like this. But what was even more interesting for, to me? So then we did a global uh, sign balance set, and we hoped that when we put fifty percent, fifty percent. A model will stop seeing this characteristic, and it stopped seeing this characteristic in a sense of the prediction. So it predicted uh, perfectly both plus and minus quantum states, and it didn't see any difference. But when we looked at the at the similarity measure, so it this influence function, it still 
uh, saw the difference between plus and minus training points. And, but this is actually, optim in, in a sense, optimistic. Because of course, we, we would like our model to be invariant to some characteristics sometimes, but it means that the similarity measure is something, something else. But this, of course, begs the question what it really means that machine learning is invariant to some property, whether predictions are uh, invariant or whether it, it doesn't say it at all. And it's a, it's a physical question. And then final example. Uh, I, sorry, I, I, I didn't get this last comment. Like, so uh, can you? The, 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 invari the invariant. Yeah. This, yeah, so uh, we can say that, for, that, you know, if we have some observe in quantum physics, when we have some observables, and we calculate them because, we, and we take some, you know, modulus square, we lose some information in the meantime, and then the result is invariant of this, for example, sign of your, of your, of your wave function, right? But, and the question is, here it's, here it's, here we know what invariance means, but in case of machine learning model, where, where we want to make it independent or invariant to some property, for example, physical property like sign, so it kind of, it, 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 it reminds about invariance, what is really invariant? Whether it means that your model that doesn't, it seems that your model doesn't uh, uh, doesn't look at this property when making predictions. So, for example, the accuracy of the predictions is exactly the same for plus and negative and minus quantum states. Is it is it enough to say the model is invariant, or it also needs to be blind to this characteristic because here we have an example where accuracy is perfect for both kinds of uh, quantum states but when we look inside we see that we see that the model see the difference still see the difference between plus and minus states so the question is what is really invariance in the in the machine learning model right so okay so so this particular model was not what Wait, wasn't invariant in the end because it did see the difference. Okay. Depends how to define it, right? It was it was invariant if you want to have the same accuracy uh, independent of the sign, but it wasn't invariant if you wanted to be blind to the to the quality. Sure, sure. But I don't know what's what's invariant still. So this is something to decide, I guess, by the community. Okay, and then one quick. Uh, this is pretty funny. So, uh, because I was telling you that uh, if you go uh, in the plot directions, uh, your prediction on your test point shouldn't change at all unless your model is guessing, so ma making extrapolation. And it is especially useful to see that when you have out of distribution test points. So, when your test points are very different from your training points because they are taken from different distributions. And your usual model, your usual machine learning model, will make a prediction on that, as I mean, and won't give you any red flag uh, uh, when making as compared to when it's making to a, a, a prediction on a regular test point. And sometimes you don't know whether it's a, a, what, when there's OOD test point or not. And we hope that this extrapolation score will be the red flag that you, that you need. So to mimic this auto distribution test points. We took our simulated data, this is like in fog basis, and we run, did a random permutation of eigenvector elements. So this would amount to expressing the vector uh, in a differently ordered fog basis. So in, it still makes sense, and there is still the information we need, but the representation changed, and we would love our model to tell us that, oh, may, I'm using my knowledge, but it's not exactly the same as, as I had in training data. And the, what you can do, and this is across the first transition, some phase transition we don't even, but it's like looting a liquid and charge density wave one. And this red uh, dashed points are the ones that we permuted. So this out of distribution test points. And we compared the indicators by this extrapolation score of ours, this triangles, against the test loss. So test loss sometimes shows, sometimes it's uh, uh, interpreted as a, a certainty of your model but it stops working when you have out of distribution test points. So why, this is why, why, it's, uh, why it's important. So you can see that sometimes this test point is showing it really, so this test loss shows perfectly the, the, this out of distribution points here and here, but sometimes it's just a really, really small dip. And sometimes it's not visible at all, like here. And sometimes even it, it, it thinks it's even more certain than it should be. And that this, uh, this extrapolation score shows them, highlights them perfectly. So this is exactly what we, not this, 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 
it, it is exactly what we hoped to see, right? So this is this is promising. Okay, and finally, really quickly, when you when you compute this error bars across the transition, depending on how narrow the transition is or how wide, you can get get a guess whether in this system the transition is wider or it's it's uh, or it's more like more narrow. And here we know that it has to be narrow because it's 14 sites. Uh, calculation is 12, same. so because of the finite size effect, we have squeezed transition, and we see that as we hope to see that. So this is it. Oh, this is lots of text. But OK, basically, we advocate the need for individual and variable machine learning, especially in physics. We propose methods based on hash and because they don't, they don't impact any architecture, any training, anything. They are just completely agnostic of that. And with that, we have the similarity measure, which with which we can detect new phases and uh, analyze the data. We can ap approximate error bars and how much your model is extrapolated. So, and uh, thanks a lot for, for my collaborators. So this is, of course, Michal and uh, our IPFO team with Matek and uh, our team from uh, exper so our experimental uh, uh, team from University of Hamburg. And if you want to know more, I will, I will gladly send you the slide. All the code is published always. I really open, in, I really believe in open access stuff. And thanks a lot for your attention and sorry for being so over time. <laughs> no, no, it was great. great uh, many thanks, for, thanks the, a lot. for the great talk. We have uh, time for questions and, and comments to the speaker. Thank you. So all people stayed, so they weren't, you know. Hmm. Pulled off. Like. No, you never know. <laughs> you know, without video, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least four people stayed then. Yes. <laughs> um, hi, Anna. I'm Bray Ganardi from Gdansk. I have, uh, thank you for your talk, first of all. Um, I have some questions like um, the, your method is basically based on computing Hessian and like some associated quantities to it, right? Do you have any ideas of how to compute this um, like efficiently or something like that? Because for gradients, it's really hard and they have this back propagation stuff, right? Can yes, you do yes. this for Hessian too or? Yes, it's a very good question. So, so uh, um, calculation of the Hessian, if you have, actually the limiting thing is not how to calculate it at all. It's calculating it for large models because the Hessian is with respect to the parameters of the model. If your model is like, has 1,000 parameters, uh, you can really use backpropagation exactly as you as you as you said. So then, instead of so, it, it you need to play a little bit with that uh, in the when when coding because so usual backpropagation uh, works for gradients and then you might you need and because it needs to remember all like previous steps down on the uh, on your operations to, to calculate a, a real gradient, right? So then you need to pro propagation, but uh, put additional flag telling, okay, I will remember, remember, I will be doing a second order um, optimization. I will need a second gradient. So remember this back propagation, and I will do it again. So, so you just do back propagation twice in twice, essence. Exactly, but it's uh, but it's definitely more expensive, right? Because you have to rem uh, keep everything in memory, uh, and uh, so this is this is a thing, and this shows you, and th this scales badly. Uh, in this sense, so that's why when your when your model grows, uh, calculating exactly Hessian stop, stop, stops being feasible. Uh, so in what you do in turn, uh, you don't calculate Hessian exactly. You calculate Hessian vector product. In our in our formula, we have a inverse of the Hessian, and we have a gradient of the test of the training point, right? So instead of calculating a separately Hessian and, and multiplying by that, you can make an approximation of, of Hessian vector product. So in one in one moment, you need to store in memory just one vector, and uh, as a result of this uh, of this, uh, and there are ways of approximating it. I, I'm using something called stochastic approximation, and uh, it's it's still expensive, but it's it's I mean scaling is very well very good. So but yeah, it's definitely. A challenge, numerical challenge to, to, to do that. Okay. And um, out of curiosity, how how big of a model can you do this for? Uh, so uh, all all my all results I got so far for physics, I managed to have 
models which are like up to 2000 parameters and then I can do it exact and then I ca the calculation of the Hessian like it's like half an hour so it's awesome but the if you want to go to largest and this is authors what the authors of this method did they analyzed a like regular huge network for MEs and I think they went to like half a million parameters I think but then they calculated the, 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 the approximated version, of course. And I never tried this large, so I don't know how it scales with time. When I was playing with, I think, 100,000 parameters, single HVP like this uh, took me like three to five hours. And But this HVP is just for a single training point. So you need to do it for every training point, And it does Is this on well. CPU or GPU? GPU. Or Ah, okay. Uh, okay, it, it depends. I mean, okay. uh, you can do it, on, of course, on, on, on GPU, it's awesome, but I, I didn't have that large a GPU for this 1,000, uh, 1, 100,000 parameters, so I okay. had to leave with CPU, and then, yeah, you, you, lose, you lose your nice scaling. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. More questions or comments? Uh, so uh, so about those numbers, uh, like the number of parameters. So yeah. like I understand that this. Uh, so uh, how how it uh, well say compares to the system size that you're investigating, right? Because the, uh, perhaps very, the, <laughs> the number of parameters. Question, question, is, question yeah. of physicists. Very well. Exactly. Um, okay, so you're touching my favorite subject. <laughs> now I can talk for another hour. No, so <laughs> cool. uh, yeah, so. Uh, I know what you what you're like touching upon. So of, there is you know this belief that if we go to we have too many parameters compared to training points or even complexity of our physical model, then we will just overfit. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, we will be able to you know co having enough of parameters, we can we can uh, solve any problem we want, but it's it won't it would be a brute force, nothing nothing sophisticated. But it turned out. And this is the power of, of, machine, of modern machine learning approaches. So this belief died in 90s. Uh, this is when people were, were careful about number of parameters uh, because there is this bias uh, variance trade-off and I'm happy to discuss it more, but basically uh, you want to, the, the, your aim is to minimize the generalization error. So the test error as compared to training error, right? And uh, when you go, when you are with smaller models and which are not like, Convolutional neural networks, like for example, linear regression, you see that when you are in the limit of a small numbers, you are not able to describe the problem because it's too complex. Then you have a sweet spot, which is perfect, and then you overfit and your generation error goes up. This is a vision from 90s. And now we see that if you go to like thousands, tens of thousands, millions of parameters, miraculously, you have a double descent. So it first grows the generation error, and then it goes down almost to zero. So for some reason, and people still don't know why, the overparameterized models generalize well. And this is, I would say, if, if one solves this, this would be like a hero of machine learning. There are some ideas why it happens. And my favorite is called lottery ticket hypothesis. I don't know if you want to listen about that. <laughs> but uh, the idea is that you start with your huge model with many, many, many parameters. You, may, you always start with random initialization. So you always start from some place and then you do uh, optimization, right? You do the random optimization actually with such overparameterized model, when you do random initialization, you already kind of have a sub network which is almost close to the solving the system. And actually you kind of just look at the small network and you further optimize it and the rest is kind of non-important. So it either goes to zero or something. So this is the hypothesis which is so I thought it was it was solving the problem, but it turns out it's it's not happening for any data set and for any model. So probably there's maybe some phases of the training dynamics and yeah. So this is complex. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> that, that's very interesting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I love the summary that this is complex. So uh, uh, just uh, uh, the like follow up to this. What about the like uh, opposite direction, namely? If you don't have enough parameters, because I imagine that, well, if you want to at some point, uh, well, perhaps it's a, a distant future, but at some point, if you want to apply this to the, you know, uh, uh, stuff that you 
uh, well, uh, cannot even simulate and stuff like this, uh, right? Uh, to to actually do something, then it should mm -hmm. be scalable in terms of the well number of qubits, yeah, right? Uh, which is, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, so about what about this other direction? Uh, what do you think? About well, it? I really love this question. Um, so so far we're so I would say people are thinking about it but not very they're not maybe super keen because we still have so many questions to answer and there are still no simulators which you know are much are much larger and much more complex than machine learning models that we can tackle so we're still not at this regime however the simple answer would be that this is actually pretty easy to see in a sense if you have not enough parameters of your model you, you won't be able to minimize your training error too well. And so this, this regime is actually easier to see, easier to like judge and to see that we don't have enough, enough expressive power than the other when we have this need to this test, test data and look at them. So when you're not able to solve the training problem, that means you're not having a powerful model, uh, enough uh, of a, enough powerful model, but this is, Absolutely interesting, amazing question. I love it. Uh, what people are, so for example, there are some theoretical guarantees about some regimes. So for example, even for a simple neural network with a, uh, with a um, single hidden layer, there is a, this universal representation theorem, I think, or general universe, uh, representation theorem saying that with this and with uh, arbitrary nonlinearity, so then I, here I showed you here I showed you this kind of nonlinearity, which is the most uh, common, the ReLU. But you can think of many various nonlinearities that you input. But if you take just input layer, one hidden layer, and then output layer, so a single hidden layer, and you can play also with the with the form of nonlinearities, and you don't put a bound on the number of hidden uh, of the hidden neurons, you can approximate any function in the world. This is and this is like mathematical proof for that. Of course, you don't also have a bound for uh, when you when you fix the form of the nonlinearities, you also don't have a theoretical bound on number of these parameters. But there are some what I, what I mean. There are some ideas and thoughts which are saying that these are pretty expressive models, so probably they will be able to. Uh, yeah, approximate also because after all, even if it's you know super high dimensional Hilbert space, after all, the thing that it sits there is a function. So, so um, yeah. So I think I, I would be optimistic about that. I'm I'm more pessimistic about other problems, but uh, yeah. So so you're optimistic about scalability. About scalability, yeah, yes. That's Not ab that's about, nice. About interpretability, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool. Okay, so I guess we are entering slowly into like podcast format, you know, <laughs> podcasts, like yes. or video cast or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ask Anna. Uh, so uh, more questions, comments. I have some, but like. Yeah. So actually, I've got a question. Uh, I'm Jan from from University of Gdańsk. Uh, because. You showed um, this uh, uncertainty measure, and th the question is related to this: Do you have the some some way to distinguish between good uncertainty estimation or uh, or not good uh, uncertainty estimation? So, do you have the measure for the quality of uncertainty estimation? That's uh, that's my question. Mm, so the only so f okay so f I think mm, I don't have any measure, but the good thing about this bootstrapping is that you see convergence with the how many b you take. Of course, it gets expensive, but you see some convergence about with the, of this variance, uh, depending on how many bootstrap you take, how many repetitions you take. So I would say if you are careful enough and you converge long enough, you are pretty sure that this is what the method gives you. If you can treat it as a you know full uncertainty, this was you were we were discussing that with Philip, I think. And it's not you know true uncertainty in a sense 
how badly your model, how how much knowledge about true world it, it is missing. This is not this kind of uncertainty. It, it's, you can think about uncertainty coming from instability of the model. But then I think it's, uh, I mean, if you if it converges, I think I'm happy. But you may be right that I'm too optimistic here. And maybe we should have some other um, measure. Yeah, yeah. because the, the, the question was, because that's the one uh, way to, to measure this uncertainty. And one can, you know, figure out some other measure of uncertainty. Yeah. And in, I was in, wondering if there is a measure to compare these two approaches to measure the uncertainty. Oh, in this sense. Okay. Oh, okay. Now I now understand. Uh, so immediately nothing comes to my mind, but give me a second. I mean, ap apart from, um, no, I think unfortunately we are really ex ex we are ex experiment uh, we are experimentalists in a sense. So uh, you would probably try to create a, like a, some kind of a benchmark data set with some test points which are different or taken from other distribution in a special in a like fixed way, and then you would need to uh, show your measure uncertainty measures on that. But I'm not familiar with that with any such a data set that it would exist. But it actually sounds like something which is very needed and I haven't thought about it. <laughs> but you see, these are excellent questions that you guys are asking. And we are really just beginning to, to, to formulate these problems and answer these kind of questions. And yeah, so well, now, now I'm doing like postdoc hunts and I'm discussing this stuff with people and everyone like, are like, but it's impossible that machine learning community still haven't answered this kind of questions. And, and yeah. It's possible. It's not done. I think it's too much applied, like too much applied science to be like you know properly, slowly, rigorously proven. Okay. Thank you very much. I will do the benchmark. Yeah, I think I would. Yeah, I will need. I will think about this benchmark. Benchmarking it sounds nice. Um. So can I have some questions like about physics actually? Okay. So, uh, okay, maybe one first. Uh, so, okay, I'm I'm a bit okay. I'm not close to this field, but I'm a bit puzzled by the fact that you plug in the whole wave function to your, let's say, classificator. Because mm -hmm. uh, let's say, I mean, okay, like because if you go to larger systems, it's totally unfeasible, and also maybe it would be nice, you know, to like. To be able to get some kind of information, like this kind of information from the system without uh, ha uh, having the full tomographic information about your state, uh, right? Like you, we don't uh, look on like when you know when you know when we do some simple classification. I know it's, it doesn't compare like cats versus dogs. We don't uh, look under the microscope uh, on the fur of the uh, of those pets, right? Yeah, so, this is a very uh, nice point. Yeah. Uh, so, I would say this is exactly, I mean, this is where the field is going, but you also, like, you, you need to, like, you know, forgive us. So, uh, we, we uh, as, a, as a field in the physics, we also had many skeptical people on the way, and I think that we are at the moment when we kind of are getting, I mean, we are starting to believe that this tool is promising, and uh, we did that by doing many calcul many calculations whose results we knew like we knew from the beginning on a fully controllable systems computed on our computer. So I think this is the stage we are like living finally. And uh, actually, when it comes to, for example, this experimental data, right? This time of plate images, of course, it, to some degree, it contains all, all your wave function, not not like for fully, of course. But even this, there are just two papers two or maybe three papers doing machine learning and experimental data. This is how slow and how you know, undeveloped we are. Uh, so definitely we're getting into this direction. And this is, of course, this is the, the aim. But I think first we need to really prove that it can work in the control scenarios. Uh, sure. So follow up question about yeah. this experimental data, actually. Yeah. So just, the, just if I, and the sense, well, uh, topological phases, they are kind of defined by the, 
Yeah, like order parameter cannot be local. So you should yeah. be able to distinguish between those phases by local information. Yes. And still, okay, you uh, like you do the training on those images, like uh, you, you, mm -hmm. you do your, let's say, machine learning magic. And let's say you, you see some blueprint maybe of those, uh, yeah. uh, of those phases. So my question is actually about like physics of those uh, pictures, not about uh, your uh, like machine learning. Mm -hmm. So like like they they presented like uh, they represent uh, time of flights. Uh, yeah. So do they, like do you do some I know like so is it local or global information or there is some Fourier transform involved? Like that's my because like if it was local, I I would be like so it would be surprising mm -hmm. to me that even yeah. though th those things are uh, local you can sort of uh, see some blueprint of anything because it's anyway some form of classical processing that you are doing mm -hmm. on the high level right uh, yeah, yeah yeah definitely uh no to, to some degree it's uh i mean i'm temp as a theorist i'm tempted to say that it's a, it's a global information but probably in practice we're losing something I, but i don't know i'm not that i'm an expert on that but uh, this is so you don't do you by the how how you how your atoms you you, you start with atoms uh, which are trapped in your optical lattice you shake it and then you do some okay how can maybe I could even slide about that but I hope that you won't ask because I don't I'm not yeah okay <laughs> but basically what happens here uh, what, what's your what your physics look like so you want to. Uh, uh, to simulate the topological phases, you need to break two kinds of symmetries, and uh, and to do that, you you have to create this kind of complex uh, complex system when you have hexagonal lattices, and they have an offset of energies between neighboring sides, and together, and then you have to shake everything, and together they break these two kind of symmetries. You have the topological phases depending on how much you shake and what is your shaking phase, and uh, when you remove and when you stop trapping and you allow to expand how by seeing how far atoms got from the center of the of the trap of the like of the of, the, of your setup you can trace back the momentum they had at the moment of the release right so it, this is kind of information you get and you kind of and it's in a sense global because you get you look at everything at the same time and from now i may say now i may be wrong but i will say it never that i think that you could do some uh some difficult theory um, for me difficult uh, theory calculations and you can get churn numbers out of this kind of pictures i'm good yeah I, I i i should know better but unfortunately i don't i i would i, I can tell you later uh, when i check it but so uh so you in practice i think you can so but what i'm saying i'm pretty sure that the globe the inform the global information is there probably you know scattered and like uh, with noise but it's there but I don't remember how to recover it, like your uh, uh, Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So, any more questions or, and comments to Anya? We are, yeah, you're almost like, uh, no, we had once, no, probably it's like the longest seminar we recorded. It was like we had a longer one, but we stopped recording earlier. <laughs> I don't know if I should be flattered or like that I failed really badly. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's good. Uh, okay, if there are no more, actually, just uh, not related to your talk. Do you like actually with Philip? We would like to talk to you about some sure, sort of some it. scientific idea, like. But maybe uh, okay. Uh, in, like we just sh shoot you an email if that's okay. Maybe now now we are like sort of maybe not today, but in the next couple of days. I love that. Thanks a lot. Cool. Uh, thanks. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, yeah. And see thanks you next week. Thanks, Anya, again for the great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.